Hey everyone, Pivotal Paper just published on the long-term effectiveness and safety of the low FODMAP diet. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. Very excited to share the results from this seminal paper with you. Now, as a quick aside, the low FODMAP diet, I'll define it in a moment, one of the most effective diets for improving gut health, reducing IBS symptoms, reducing leaky gut, improving inflammatory bowel disease, criticisms have been levied against the diet that it might pose risks in the long term, perhaps being deleterious for your microbiota maybe even leading to nutrient deficiencies. And that's exactly what this seminal paper is addressing. So let's jump in and cover the details. As a quick preamble, what are FODMAPs? FODMAPs are types of carbohydrates that are non-digestible by our GI tract and are rather fermented and metabolized by our intestinal bacteria. And the acronym FODMAPs stands for fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. A lot of words just to say that the structure of these carbohydrates are digested by bacteria and feed them. And these foods can be problematic for some people. A rough heuristic would be the more symptomatic you are, the more likely these foods might actually be triggers. A quick list here, this is just a short selection High FODMAP foods include broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, garlic, onions, avocado. So these could be triggers. Conversely, lower FODMAP foods, kale, spinach, carrots, cucumbers, green beans, and zucchini. And then regarding a couple fruits, apples would be high FODMAP and things like blueberries and raspberries are lower FODMAP. And again, why this matters is there are clinical trials demonstrating benefit for a wide array of digestive symptoms or syndromes when using a lower FODMAP diet approach. But some have voiced concern, and to be honest, some have voiced totally theoretical concerns. So I welcome this paper to give us a science-guided perspective on this tool, the low FODMAP diet. 2023, review paper, summarizing results of 14 studies in IBS patients, so people with food reactivity that may manifest as bloating, pain, discomfort, constipation, diarrhea, or perhaps an oscillation of the two. Looking at long-term use, six months to a year, or even in some cases, a touch longer. One very important caveat or clarification from this study, all of the studies included a elimination phase, then followed by a reintroduction phase. And most of the studies included in this review of 14 different studies included a aspect of personalizing the diet over time, meaning the food list you use on day one is not what you're using three months in. You've eliminated for a month or so, you've started to reintroduce, and then based upon your tolerance, you're consuming a modified or a personalized version of the diet. This is a crucially important concept. What happens, I'm sure some of you are probably struggling with this, you hear about how all these foods could be problematic. And people don't, in my view, do an ample job of clarifying that if you follow the right dietary plan, so you contract a little bit and do a elimination, that should lead to improved symptoms and healing, and therefore improved food tolerance over time. So you don't avoid all high FODMAP foods forever. If the diet is successful, you should be able to expand. So key point from this paper. But let's go to one of the first points, criticisms that the low FODMAP diet has not been shown to be either effective or studied in the long term. This paper found the following, that IBS symptoms were improved in all of the nine of nine studies that track them long term, that bowel habits were improved in all of the seven of seven studies that were analyzed in this review, 
and quality of life was improved in all six of the six studies that assessed quality of life from longer term use of the low FODMAP diet. So I think we can now confidently say that we have both long term study and those studies demonstrating benefit, whether it be IBS symptoms, bowel habits, or quality of life. So that's one very helpful aspect from this paper. By the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. Now this follows and sort of transitions to the second point. Well, perhaps a low FODMAP diet feels good. I have less symptoms, but it's actually doing something deleterious to my gut. Zooming out my perspective here, usually things that feel healing, reduce symptoms, are good for the individual. That's just sort of my paradigm, but let's look at the data. Two studies found no negative impact on the gut microbiota after one year. So quick context, one of the ways that it's claimed the low FODMAP diet could be deleterious is because you're not consuming high levels of the prebiotics in the FODMAPs that feed the bacteria. So it therefore follows, the criticism anyway, that longer term adherence to a low FODMAP diet could starve bacteria and have a negative effect on the microbiota. And again, two studies found no impact on the gut microbiota after one year. That's good news. What about nutrient deficiencies? Might it be that despite all these good things, you run the risk of becoming deficient in B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, what have you. That's the next point examined by this paper. Two studies found no change in body weight. Body weight's a proxy for are people under eating. So this is reassuring. Two different studies found that nutrient intake was adequate on the low FODMAP diet. However, one study did find that nutrient intake was not adequate on the low FODMAP diet. Here's the very important caveat. Nutrient intake was not adequate in anyone in this study. Picture a group of people. Half are instructed to do nothing. Just continue on your habitual diet. The other group go low FODMAP. They reassess. Neither group meets nutritional recommendations for dietary intakes. So I could see this very easily being spun and you given a misleading perspective. Now there's a parallel here that we should be thinking about. And that is if the low FODMAP diet is good at reducing symptoms, and like I mentioned before, if it has been shown to reduce things like leaky gut, and if I didn't mention that, I'll mention it now, Perhaps a low FODMAP diet could improve the absorption of nutrients. There's two components here. What you eat, we just covered no difference there in terms of nutrients. And then what you absorb. There's not a lot of data here. There's only one study I was able to find, but it's exciting nonetheless. 2021 clinical trial, small, 36 patients with IBS, three months low FODMAP. Here's what they found. Improved leaky gut, measured by zonulin, by LPS, and by the lactulose mannitol ratio test. So three different methods of assessing leaky gut. But here's the kicker. There was an 80% improvement in vitamin D levels in those who were deficient at baseline. Paraphrasing this paper, this result may be attributed to better intestinal barrier health. So this study suggests that the low FODMAP diet may actually improve nutrient absorption. I want to be careful. This is only one study. However, if we look at that in the context of people have less symptoms, they have less leaky gut, it would stand to reason that they would have improved nutrient absorption. So then we've covered long-term efficacy, no negative impact on the gut microbiota, no negative impact on nutrient absorption or nutrient intake rather, and potentially a favorable impact on nutrient absorption. Another criticism is the low FODMAP diet could have low compliance because it's hard to do. This is something I'm empathetic to, and I have some thoughts 
that I'll add, but let me just start with a few notes from the paper. Adhering to the diet when eating at restaurants with family and friends or while traveling essentially has been found to be difficult. I think that's reasonable. Looking at adherence data from six of the studies in this review paper, they found adherence between 50% to 82%. So that's pretty good. Additionally, looking at satisfaction, how happy were people at the end? 70 to 89% of participants were satisfied with the low FODMAP diet. And that's a quote from the study. So my thoughts, how can we make this less difficult, even though the data here suggests it's not too difficult, but how can we do better yet still? Again, these are my thoughts, but don't aim for perfect. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You don't have to be 100% compliant. 70, 80% seems to be ample to reduce a load of FODMAPs, have the beneficial effect on the gut, and still allow you to have some deviations on occasion. Entering my next point, depending on how you frame this, you could look at a wedding, a social event, dinner, as a, oh my God, I'm going to go off plan. I'm going to be the, the weird person who's fretting about the menu. Or what I would suggest, look at this as a reasonable opportunity to trial foods that are higher in FODMAP and see how your body responds. That paradigm shift can be huge for people. One is fear and aiming for perfection. The other is, hey, here's a chance for me to reassess my tolerance and have the fun and the freedom associated with that. And this ties in with another point I wanted to make. This is, again, my point, not from the paper per se. But again, it's really important to bear in mind that so many diets, including the low FODMAP, follow a trajectory of elimination. And if that is the right diet for you, healing, and therefore better tolerance upon reintroduction. So foods that are a problem on day one won't be a problem forever. And this is, again, so, so crucial. The number of people that I and, and we on our clinical team see in our consulting practice who have stayed permanently on a highly restrictive diet is really disheartening. And I think it's because we're not closing the loop on this conversation and informing people that as you heal and improve, you should have better food tolerance over time. And it's really important to expand. Okay. So then coming to a few conclusions from this review, quoting, following a long-term low FODMAP diet for IBS management can be effective, safe, and sustainable. This type of diet, when properly implemented, can effectively improve IBS symptoms and quality of life without sacrificing nutritional adequacy, weight, body composition, or gut microbiota composition. So this really speaks to and hopefully allays the concerns that I think reasonably so have been expressed about the low FODMAP diet. However, as a quick aside, what I will say is if you've been following the research literature here in a disciplined fashion, and you've been looking at the outcome data, it's hard to get on board with the FODMAP fear train, meaning the low FODMAP diet is going to be negative for whatever reason. And again, this study very nicely helps punctuate that conclusion. So then my recommendations, interpreting all this data down into a, a, a few guidelines, trial the low FODMAP diet for three to four weeks. If it's the right fit for you, you'll know it. And if it's not, that's okay. No diet is going to have a 100% success rate. So bear that in mind. If it's helpful, continue longer. Reintroduce around the two to three month mark and personalize the diet in the longer term. And remember, we have good evidence for six to 12 months of use in the personalized fashion. I'll include a link to our diet guide on the low FODMAP diet. We actually have three versions of the low FODMAP diet. One is standard, so it's unchanged. One is paleo, so it also reduces other inflammatory foods. And one is vegetarian. And in addition to that, I'll link to the University of Monash app where you can punch in certain foods and have some of those specific dietary questions answered for things that may not pop up on a diet guide. I'd also recommend to 
work if you feel compelled to with a health coach or nutritionist for guidance and support. And of course, myself and our clinical team are always happy to help you navigate the diet and also the bigger picture of what other adjunctive therapies can help improve your gut health and therefore reduce food reactivity and broaden your diet and improve your food tolerance. Okay, so in summary, the low FODMAP diet is one of the best studied diets for improving gut health, at least as it pertains to IBS. It's not the only diet that can help, but it is one of the best. It has a high response rate for IBS specifically, 50 to 80%. It has a high compliance rate, 70 to 89%. There are no ill effects on the microbiota. There is no risk of under eating or nutrient deficiencies given you follow the diet the right way. And remember that the right gut diet and program will improve your gut health and lead to better tolerance over time, allowing you to expand your diet. Be careful not to develop food fear. And I'll leave you with what I think is the most important rule here, which is listen to your body. Some people will really thrive on a low FODMAP diet. Other people won't. Run the experiment and ultimately, like we say in the clinic, your body is boss. If you get a good signal, keep going. If you don't, there are other dietary options. But in summary, uh, again, great paper that helps us to see the low FODMAP diet is not something that just quells symptoms and comes at a cost of deleterious effect to the microbiota or nutrient status. And it actually seems to help across the board, which makes perfect sense because like I've said so many times, if something feels good to you, it's usually health promoting and healing. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but that rule generally seems to hold. Okay, guys, well, I hope this helps. Please comment and subscribe, and I hope you will trial the low FODMAP diet if you have not yet and experience some nice benefits from it. Mm -hmm.